And Russia actually was considered in Vietnam as a legitimate successor of the Soviet Union, which used to be Vietnam a lot during the Cold War, and was the uninterrupted supporter of Vietnam during the war against the French and the war against the United States, and basically have Vietnam secure independence, and also support uh, supported Vietnam during a brief uh, but bloody war with China in 1979. And so for Vietnam, there's a lot of sentiments about Russia, and there's a lot of sense of gratitude toward Russia. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and boy, oh boy, have we had a lot of developments in this week in IR because of Russian President Vladimir Putin's visit to first to Pyongyang and then to Hanoi to do some diplomacy in North and Southeast Asia. I already talked about the huge changes that, um, that the new security treaty with Pyongyang indicates. I have a look at yesterday's video for that one. But today I want to discuss the other event that is a bit harder to interpret, namely the relationship between Russia and Vietnam, um, and more generally, Vietnamese foreign policy in this new multipolar world. Uh, to help with this task, I've got the great pleasure of talking to a Vietnamese colleague from academia, Dr. Sang Wen. Uh, Dr. Wen is a visiting fellow at Singapore's Yusuf Ishak Institute. He used to work as a journalist in Hanoi and got his PhD in political science from Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. Dr. Wen also recently published a very insightful essay in a book about uh, post-1989 neutrality, in which I also happen to have a chapter, and his essay has the beautiful title, Bamboo in the Wind, Vietnam's Quest for Neutrality. Uh, no better timing than discussing this now, because a lot of wind blowing, it seems. Dr. Wen, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. It's uh, really an honor to have the chance to talk with you and the, the channel. Well, I mean, I really appreciate you taking taking the time for this because uh, interpreting Vietnam is actually is is, is difficult. Um, so you wrote a chapter saying like, okay, this is basically a quest for neutrality, and um, a lot of things are happening to Vietnam or around Vietnam, and Vietnam seems to be organizing its foreign policy in a very particular way. Uh, and the, the the Russian Russia's visit is the third visit within a year, you know, after Mr. Biden was there and Xi Jinping was there and now Vladimir Putin. And it's like a lot of cooperation going on. How are you making sense of Vietnam just being so happy at interacting with everybody and, and elevating everybody's um, status to the highest level in, the, in, in Vietnam's foreign policy? Well, I think it should uh, start with the post-Cold War Vietnam foreign policy. And I think at the time, Vietnam was feeling a little bit uh, concerned about its status in the world because its former uh, ally during the Cold War, the Soviet Union, uh, dissolved. Uh, and then it really had to think about how it can approach uh, foreign policy in the new uh, world order because now it didn't have uh, you know, Soviet Union as its backing. And the, um, the notion of ideology actually evaporated as the core aspect of Vietnam foreign policy. After the, so the fall of Soviet Union, Vietnam actually reached out to China, uh, you know, you know, to try to set up a new, um, you know, uh, front uh, to, you know, to protect socialism around the world. But then the Chinese, uh, because of their uh, new uh, pragmatism, they actually refused. So Vietnam, you know, uh, uh, Vietnamese leaders come back to Hanoi and they think, well, now, what should we, you know, what what must be done now when we can't use ideology as the main backing of the Vietnamese state's uh, foreign policy? And then they come up with a new pragmatic approach to foreign policy, changing from the main ideological base approach to a more pragmatic base and to a more aligned with its uh, national interests, uh, which is uh, gradually developed into a bamboo diplomacy approach. So basically, bamboo diplomacy emphasize mostly on the core uh, core root. So the main root of Vietnamese uh, foreign policy, which is based on this socialist-oriented foreign policy, doesn't change. But then it has more flexibility in changing the branch of, you know, of interest depending on the uh, contextualized situation. 
And the main focus of his foreign policy is not now about ideology, but mostly about having as many friends and partners around the world as possible because it consider a you know friends and partners are the strong network for it to uh, you know to 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 build foreign policy to protect its national interests. So that explains why uh, in the past decades Vietnam uh, continued to expand a foreign policy to very different partners in the world. You have like you know North Korea, China, Russia, and the United States. And more importantly, because since uh, Vietnam joined the WTO, one trade organization uh, 20 years ago, its economy has been booming. And Vietnam increasingly uh, becomes a more important player in the Indo-Pacific region. Does that explain why many big players, including the United States, China, and Russia, all want to lure Vietnam to their own uh, you know, network of, of interest? That explains why Vietnam, um, so why so many uh, world leaders come to visit Vietnam. And that also explains why the Vietnamese states uh, host all of them, including uh, very different characters, you know, Biden, Putin, and Xi Jinping. And importantly, you know, in all of those meetings, Vietnam uh, elevated uh, the United States' military relations to the comprehensive strategic partnership, similar to Russia and China. But then they don't really come with to any block against each other. So that the secret of his uh, success is that they know the Vietnamese leaders, know the Vietnam place in the world, and know how to navigate different, uh, you know, uh, interests and different um, advantage and different disadvantage of Vietnamese position to gain, to maximize its benefits while minimizing the potential setbacks of being too close, being seen as too close to different players. You know, I am very jealous of, of Vietnam at the moment because this is actually the right way of using a neutrality policy, whereas the Swiss and so on, they 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 completely got it wrong. They just throw their lot into, into the Western camp and that's it. And they think out of that. And Vietnam obviously seems to think out of its own national interest and forge ties with everybody, be friends with everyone and, and enemies with none, right? Now, the question to me is like, okay, let's say two questions. First, um, uh, the strategic partnership, uh, comprehensive strategic partnership, which is uh, Vietnam's own categorization for its for its um, uh, um, relationships with other countries. Uh, what exactly does that entail? Why is that important? And secondly, why do you think that um, Vladimir Putin chose Vietnam as uh, the only place in Southeast Asia to go after after the North and not try to go to an, an, an other potential partners like, let's say, Indonesia or or well, maybe even Thailand. Uh, why why did he choose Vietnam and you know how, why? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a very important question. I think it's it's not easy to answer as well. For Vietnam, um, Vietnam has several levels of uh, diplomatic hierarchy. Uh, the highest level actually is not comprehensive strategic partnership, but uh, special partnerships which Vietnam only reserves to Laos, Cambodia, and Cuba. Uh, so this mm. is not about interest, because if you consider interest as the most important thing of foreign policy, obviously Laos or Cuba uh, is not really, you know, doesn't really play a lot of role in you know, either economic or uh, foreign policy of Vietnam. But still is considered as a special partner of Vietnam because of historical legacy. And uh, we will come back to his historical legacy later on when we discuss about Putin a uh, visit to Hanoi. But at the same time, uh, the um, diplomatic uh, hierarchy of Vietnamese state um, had accepted special partnership, uh, considers comprehensive strategic partnership as the highest level of recognition of friendship and partnership to, to the Vietnamese state. And uh, before 2000, and well, we only have four uh, comprehensive strategic partnerships, including uh, India, uh, Russia, China, uh, and then later on we uh, we have um, we have um, uh, South Korea, uh, and then uh, just in two thousand and twelve, uh, uh, we uh, developed a really strong uh, and active approach to expand the concept of comprehensive strategic partnership to other partners, including the most importantly, of course, the United States in, in last September when Vietnam upgraded. Uh, actually, it's double upgrade. So before uh, 2023, the United States was only a comprehensive partner, so not even strategic partner of Vietnam. But then Vietnam jumped from that to uh, to the to 
to, to double upgrade to the comprehensive strategic partnership. So for that, and then from then we proceed uh, to have Australia, uh, Japan uh, to the list. And now I think we have like seven. Um, and then next we might have Singapore and, and Indonesia as well. And many people said that, you know, when you have so many comprehensive strategic partners, it means, you know, it means less um, uh, important because, you know, when everyone is strategic and then none is strategic, right? But at the same time for Vietnam is signals. Uh, I think it sends very strong signals about its intent of having a multilateral network in improving its foreign policy because it's not just focusing on uh, main powers. It's just not focusing on very great powers of the world but trying to multilateralize its uh, foreign policy to other different partners as well. And in, in so doing, it can create a really strong network of friends and partnerships around the world and not only focusing on, on the big powers. Uh, so for that, when you have the United States on one side, China on the other side, Russia on the on the north, and then South Korea, Japan, India, all create a very strong net of friends partnership where Vietnam can stay at the center and can connect different uh, you know, points of connection around the world. So that's uh, that's the main uh, signal that Vietnam want to send. That it actually want to to build a really strategic partners with partnership with all of those uh, big powers in the world. Uh, so that's the one part of the of the answer. But if you want to uh, to interrupt, we we can talk more, and then before we can talk about Putin's visit. Yeah, it's just one question, like because like what does it mean inside Vietnam? Because as far as I understand, the strategic partnership. Um, also means that the individual Vietnamese agencies now are allowed to do more, right? So it's also like just basically unleashing the potential that that the different ministries and the different corporation agency agencies have, right? So it's not just yeah, directly yeah. to the outside; it's also to the inside. Yeah, that's true. I mean, like um, the comprehensive strategic partnership is not about the actual cooperation between Vietnamese uh, the Vietnamese state and other states, because if you look at the Russia was the second uh, comprehensive strategic partner of Vietnam after China. But then, you know, Russia, Vietnam, bilateral economic uh, and trade uh, relations is not really as big as many people expect. It's only stand as the 17th of Vietnam, uh, you know, biggest trade partner. So it's kind of like similar to nothing. But then at the same time, uh, the, um, the language comprehensive strategic partnership actually signals the uh, capacity uh, and the room of cooperation. It um, seeks to know that um, all of uh, there is no limit in cooperation between the two states at all levels. So Vietnam is very unique case because it's one party state. So when cooperating with other countries, it's not only about state to state or government to government cooperation, but also about the party to party cooperation and also about a people to people cooperation. So when you don't have this kind of comprehensive strategic partnership framework is really difficult for, let's say, uh, you know, if I work for a university in Vietnam and want to cooperate with, let's say, Stanford University in the United States, uh, it would be quite difficult if I want to um, to pivot to that cooperation because we don't have the strategic, you know, partnership. So when you want to cooperate, you have to go through a lot of uh, administrative uh, procedures and it's even more difficult to, to, to ask for uh, you know, state a sanction of uh, cooperation. But when you have this kind of comprehensive strategic partnership, then it would signal that it would be easy for you to go and just cooperate with anyone, literally anyone in the United States, if you want to do so. And of course, there is uh, some constraints depending on the uh, you know, ideological considera considerations. You know, it's not that easy that you can cooperate with the, the United States uh, as freely because there might be a concern about uh, you know, color revolution, stuff like that. And we, we cooperate with some Chinese universities. There would be some concern about national interest. But at the same time, this is the, basically there's, uh, there's no constraint in theory when you want to cooperate. And so let's say, uh, if I want, if the Vietnam state wants to have a kind of like military trio with the, the United States and more intelligence sharing, for example, previously, but it, it was very difficult because we are not comprehensive strategic partners. So there's some kind of like um, constraints in the part of more, you know, politically sensitive topics like military cooperation or intelligence sharing. 
But now, when we are comprehensive strategic partners, it's easier for you know for people, uh, especially for officers at the lower level, to to propose cooperation, and it's easier to get a permit for for that. So basically, it has a kind of framework for you to cooperate freely with other states, uh, which make it more you know uh, give it more leeway to you know, different kind of cooperation it wants to. Yeah, so basically, it's a liberalization as well, right? Uh, of 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 trade opportunities and cooperation opportunities that this framework then gives. Uh, now, maybe let's move to the other question. Uh, why do you think uh, it was Vietnam and Hanoi uh, as a second place after Pyongyang? Uh, do you think that Mr. Putin is also trying to signal to the friends, because Vietnam has a lot of friends, right, including Japan, including South Korea, that, you know, uh, basically empowering North Korea, I mean, that's not the only thing that's going on, or how do you see it? Yeah, I think it's it's uh, from the, the Russian perspective. I'm not Russian, but I, from what I guess, uh, what Mr. Putin wants to, to signal is that it's not really being internationally isolated, because uh, when you visit it, uh, a paria state in North Korea is, is say nothing, right? But when you come to Hanoi and get a really warm welcome from the Vietnamese state, it's a different story because uh, after 2000 and, and, uh, uh, 2021, I think Vietnam has become an extremely important uh, partner of, of the West and China. So it grow in the region. Is I think it's uh, are increasingly uh, more and more important. So when Putin visits um, Hanoi and get a warm, warm re re reception. I think it signals uh, the fact that Russia is not really being isolated. It still has some very good friends in Vietnam. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, I think the, the reason why Mr. Putin chose Vietnam and why Vietnam um, you know, accepted uh, Mr. Putin visit, uh, I think there are a lot of different dimensions. First, and I think very important dimension, which uh, many, I think many international media and, and analysts um, didn't really raise it properly, is about the sentimental aspect of foreign policy in Vietnam. And Russia actually was considered in Vietnam as a legitimate successor of the Soviet Union, which used to be Vietnam a lot during the Cold War, and was the uninterrupted supporter of Vietnam during the war against the French and the war against the United States and basically have Vietnam security dependence and also support uh, support of Vietnam during a brief uh, but bloody war with China in 1979. And so for Vietnam, there's a lot of sentiments about Russia and there's a lot of sense of gratitude toward Russia as well because of the historical connection between Vietnam and the Soviet Union. And also when Mr. Putin became president in 2000, it, he actually personally canceled many debts that the Vietnamese state owned to the Soviet Union. I think around like 80% of the, of the debts. So that's a huge amount of money for, for Vietnam at that time. So the sense of uh, gratitude is very strong, not only among the top leaders, including the, uh, the general secretary of the Communist Party of Vietnam, who is the leader of basically the, the supreme leader of Vietnam. In Hu Chok, he, he Study in Russia for quite a long time, and he still know Russia, and he has a lot of you know, personal stories and relevance to 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 Russia himself, but also for the whole population, uh, which still has a lot of strong connection to Russia, and still you know hold a lot of uh, you know, sentiments toward Russia. So that's why I, I I personally believe that Mr. Putin chose Vietnam because it sends uh it might get a warm welcome. In, in Vietnam, not only among the leadership in Hanoi, but also among the population as well. And uh, secondly, um, except the sentimental aspect, I think Vietnam and Russia still has a lot of room for cooperation. And Vietnam, especially security-wise, depends a lot on Russia. 80% of its arms arm supply comes from Russia, and Russia is the main player to support Vietnam in the South China Sea project, especially on the oil and gas um, you know, uh, um, ventures on the South China Sea as the main tool of Vietnam to counter Chinese influence on the South China Sea. So for that, Vietnam really needs Russia. It's not only about sentiment, you know, sentimental aspect, but also about the you know real politics as well. Vietnam needs Russia for defense and security, and Russia needs Vietnam to show the world that it's not being isolated. 
Yeah, I find it's just so fascinating because when we read in the Western media, they have nothing better to to talk about than oh, you know, all the weapons that Vietnam gets from from Russia and you know uh, Putin's aims when when like in consideration considering Ukraine. But one of the things that I think is overlooked is that, as you said, these weapons are actually most important for Vietnam. To, against China. And China is like at the moment best buddy with, with Russia, right? So in a sense, Russia is, is also walking a tightrope here because I don't think that they want to, uh, to uh, antagonize the Chinese. Um, could you explain a little bit the, the problems that Vietnam has with China, be, despite the fact that both of them are still officially uh, communist leaderships, whereas Russia is officially not communist anymore, right? So obviously we are beyond this ideological part, but um, Vietnam's problems are mainly maritime borders, right, with, mm -hmm. uh, with China. The, 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 the land border is more or less undisputed, isn't it? That's true. Yeah, the land border is... Um demarcated, I think, 20 years ago. So the most serious problem between Vietnam and China now remains on the sea, especially on the maritime uh, disputes um, of the islands, the Prasel and Spratly, and also the South China Sea, uh, different vast areas of South China Sea as well. And more importantly, some it's not only about, you know, uh, about the borders, about the maritime disputes, but also about the concern from the Vietnamese leader of Chinese increasing influence in the region, especially in Laos and Cambodia. Because for Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia serve as not only, you know, uh, not only friends and neighbors and or brothers, but also kind of like a fence, you know, for Vietnam to uh, to protect its own national security. So Vietnam really, after the Cold War, Vietnam has spent, it, has spent a lot of money and resources in sticking Laos and Cambodia uh, you know, together in Vietnam as a have like more or less the same block. But then when 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 the Chinese um became much more uh powerful uh after you know after the Beijing the big two thousand eight, they uh replaced Vietnam as the biggest investor and economic players in Laos and Cambodia. And I think Chinese ambition I think um creates a lot of concern among the Vietnamese leader, not only about the maritime, but also about the um their influence in Laos and Cambodia. So Vietnam is a long, very long country. When you have the pressure from the maritime dispute on the South China Sea, and then you have pressure from Laos and Cambodia, it basically trapped between the two prong of Chinese influence. So that I think that's the biggest geopolitical concern of the Vietnamese, and why they need uh, the Russians to step in, at least to provide more security in oil and gas projects on the South China Sea. And very important to note that while Vietnam has a lot of different partners, Vietnam has ExxonMobil, for example, from the United States. Uh, we have, uh, you know, some Spanish uh, you know, oil exploration uh, companies, India, South Korea, but only the Russians have and have been there long enough and have been strong or let's say brave enough to stand up against a Chinese pressure. Um, a very important example, I think, is was in 2019, when Spanish Repsol uh, oil exploration company had to withdraw from uh, an oil project in Vietnam because of Chinese pressure. But Russians never really, uh, you know, go down to the Chinese pressure and still operate and have Vietnam to operate uh, its oil and gas project. So I think that's, um, that's really uh, creates a really strong trust among the Vietnamese leaders about Russian intention and Russian support uh, for Vietnam on the maritime dispute on the South China Sea. But of course, at the same time, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there has been, I think, concern among the Vietnamese leaders about the long-term trajectory of the Russian and Chinese um, development. And that also, I think, play into the consideration of inviting Mr. Putin to visit Hanoi and then have more open discussion about, you know, the um, the, the cooperation between Vietnam and Russia in oil and gas um, projects, and also the strengthening of the Vietnamese-Russian uh, ties amidst, you know, uncertain geopolitical um, context. For the Russians, I think, I mean, like, of course, nowadays they need, you know, Beijing more than the other way around. But if you don't hold any cards to play, and then that would, you know, totally very, uh, 
very disadvantageous position when you negotiate with China in terms of trade and in terms of technical support. When Russia supports Vietnam on the South China Sea, I think it gives these Russians more, let's say, bargaining chip when they negotiate uh, different, um, you know, very hard treaties and different uh, conditions for, for Chinese support. And I think that also, you know, in Russian interest as well, not only about supporting a loyal friend in Vietnam, but also give, Ch- give the Russians more tool in order to uh, bargain a better deals with, with China uh, in future and not letting uh, the Chinese um, control all of the narrative about cooperation within Russia and China. So I think there's a lot of complex geopolitical gameplay between, uh, you know, among the three countries, Russia, China, and the United States. And just to make it a little bit more complicated, how do you see the role of ASEAN within this uh, within this complex? I mean, the 10 ASEAN states... Uh, soon to be eleven uh, uh, are uh, they they are very different from the EU. They are very different from other regional uh, agreements. But one thing is clear: they want to stick together, right? And they they do see Southeast Asia as this common sphere and this common this mm-hmm. common space that they want to share. They have like several concepts, including a zone for peace, freedom, and neutrality. You know, to say like we want to keep everything as open as possible. Mm-hmm. Do you think that the connection, the Russian Vietnamese connection, is also a way of tethering? Uh, Russia also to the to to the ASEAN space, or would that be taking it too far? Well, I think I think definitely uh, Vietnam can serve uh, at a, you know as a very uh, very important bridge to connect uh, Russia to uh, the Southeast Asia uh, countries, uh, ASEAN, of course, uh, as a very important reason. Uh, it has six uh, nearly seven hundred million people, mostly young people, and very growing. Uh, economies, including Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, of course. So, I mean, like, it really can serve as an alternative um, pathway for Russia to, to develop economically outside the Western world. So I think that's that aspect of ASEAN, uh, you know, um, as an important alternative partner of Russia cannot be ruled out. And Vietnam, of course, as the one of the biggest members in ASEAN can, of course, have uh, Russia in, in, in that um, consideration. Uh, for Vietnam, I think Vietnam has, uh, since becoming a member of ASEAN in 1995, uh, uh, I think Vietnam uh, always considered ASEAN as a very important platform for Vietnam to, at least to, um, to public its uh, national interest. And to show the world how it can, uh, you know, how, how it's, uh, carry out its foreign policy of, uh, multilateralism. But at the same time, uh, ASEAN has not really been very effective in helping claimant states, including Vietnam and the Philippines, in its, uh, fight against, uh, Chinese influence of uh, aggression on the South China Sea. And Vietnam knows it really well. And that explains why Vietnam has expanded its, um, comparative strategic partnership with different countries. United States, Japan, and South Korea are very important countries that can help Vietnam to leverage and to solve the deficit that ASEAN cannot help to uh, to solve. Because of course, ASEAN, like you say, is not European Union. It has a lot of uh, disadvantages, uh, mostly about the um, you know about the different or even divergent uh, perceptions of Chinese threat uh, on the region. Countries like Laos and Cambodia or Myanmar. They totally consider the South China Sea as a, as a core problem. And they, they, they don't want to sacrifice their economic interests with, uh, with China because of, you know, the pressure from the South China Sea. Meanwhile, uh, maritime countries like Malaysia, Philippines, and Vietnam all believe that South China Sea is very important and they, they want to have more, you know, capital like stronger stance of ASEAN uh, solidarity against a Chinese encroachment. On the South China Sea, but that you know that failed for many times, yeah. and that explains why you know the Philippines, for example, they totally abandoned its neutral neutrality, like what we were saying, and now becoming you know as a uh, as a uh, American ally, they stiff like substantially toward the United uh, States. Vietnam play a different games, but basically they know that uh, they know the limits of ASEAN. They know that if they only depend on ASEAN, they can never really. Um, you know, pivot is foreign policy to what that can maximize the interest and protect itself against, you know, the, the Chinese increasingly 
uh, powerful position on the South China Sea. Yeah, you know, it's absolutely clear. ASEAN cannot work as a guarantor. As a, it's not a security alliance. It's not. It doesn't have this component, and also the way it is structured, mm -hmm. the consensus mechanism, it, it can't do that. Even though it, there is like all the rhetorical support. Yeah. But yeah. It, this comparison between the Vietnamese strategy and the Filipino strategy is very interesting because the problem is very similar. Um, China mm -hmm. uh, has claims that these two states also have claims on. If you look at it on a map, it's you know. Uh, it's it's difficult to uh, to 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 um to to find a lot of empathy for the Chinese position if you look where these <laughs> islands are on maps. But okay, fine. I mean, let's put this aside. Um, the 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 Filipinos also have tried for a, a time to play a neutral game, but they gave that up. They have now more more bases, and they they are doing hard security relations with the U.S. <laughs> uh, Vietnam still has its four nos. Could you quickly explain the four nos, and could you could you explain how how you think Vietnam is trying to use this neutral stance as also yeah. a security stance? vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China. Uh -huh. Yeah, so basically the foreign policy of Vietnam is about that, you know, Vietnam would not attack any countries, Vietnam would not like bend uh, you know, with one side against another, Vietnam would not allow other countries to to use its base, you know, as you know, as a base to attack other countries and Vietnam will not uh, will will not use violence or, you know, uh, military uh, tools to to solve international disputes. So basically it's, it's about you know active actively uh stating is neutrality um as a state which do not uh you know first do not like uh, have any kind of like military alliance and second would not uh tolerate any use of military threats or uh coercion against another state whether as you know using Vietnam as a as a you know a, you know a, a platform to to attack another country, or whether Vietnam involved directly in uh, military uh, coercion with a, uh, another country. Uh, so for that, is, I think the most important thing is that this, this for knows is about military alliance, which, uh, you know, to show the signals are not only friends of Vietnam, but also uh, potential rivals of Vietnam, including the Chinese, is that Vietnam would not, uh, you know, uh, ally with another country to uh, to Gang, gang up against China. So I think this is a very important signal, and and uh, it shows that Vietnam would not be, I uh, would not want to be used as the tool of you know great power, right? So I think the, the the approach of Vietnam and Philippines, I think, is differs significantly in, in such uh, in such um, you know in such perception about the use of military alliance, because I think it's also ar arose from the uh, the historical. Um, uh, past of Vietnam during the Cold War, because when Vietnam, um, you know, during the Cold War, Vietnam was a Soviet ally, and Vietnam knows that, you know, becoming, you know, being, uh, you know, a small pawn in the great power game, actually, uh, is not really a good position for 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 smaller countries like Vietnam, and it knows really well, because of that, after the after the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. It has to change its foreign policy. It has to uh, depend on, on different pathways to protect its national interests. And I think uh, Vietnam is previously we we are, we are a member of the Vietnam Alignment Movement, but now it's I would say Vietnam is kind of like multi aligned with uh, different countries. And the the biggest the biggest partners of Vietnam are not you know are not the biggest countries are not China or or United States or Russia, but actually middle powers. The Japanese, the South Koreans, the Indians are uh, all of those emerging powers. Vietnam believe that by you know by uh, sticking to those middle powers, they can actually um, build up a stronger and more trustworthy network of friends and partnerships that can support each other. And in so doing, Vietnam can gain is um, and protect its interests by establishing a strategic autonomy instead of you know band wagoning uh to uh, great powers which you know can abandon you you know in, in times of difficulties. And I think this is a very important case because uh let's say let's think about two thousand and twelve, um, you know, during the, the second tenure of, of uh, President Barack Obama. Uh, I think there was a uh, controversies around the Scarborough show in the Philippines. And at the time, the, the Chinese came to a discovery show and that stayed there. 
and then the Philippines uh protest of course and then you know uh at the time Kurt Campbell uh the the now Indo Pacific Shah of the the Biden administration make a deal with the Chinese say that well now we we should both like withdraw the Chinese withdraw and then the Philippines withdraw the Philippines believe in Kurt Campbell's deal and then they withdraw from the Scarborough Show but then the Chinese are stay there and then they lost. And then, then, then the United States, they didn't do anything about that. And that's one of the very small examples that show that, you know, great powers, you know, sometimes they abandon it, they, they small allies. And for countries like Vietnam, because of the history of the Cold War, Vietnam knows really well that, you know, if you only depend on one direction, one, one big power to, to protect your national interests, there is very big risks if you put your eggs in different directions. And actually, if you trust your more or less peer friends, you know, the friends which has similar amount of powers and potentially more interest in upholding the international laws and orders, like the Japanese or South Korea or India, it may be easier for Vietnam to protect its interests rather than that depending on, you know, only so power, which can change, um, you know, the, which uh, the, their poli- uh, policies can change very significantly depending on who is the president, right? So I think that's a different pathway of uh of the Vietnamese and Philippines in dealing with uh the South China Sea uh problem. I'm not sure whether which one is you know a correct way, but I think it really depends on the uh, the context and the situations of 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 each country to uh, to establish yeah. uh you know better way to solve their own uh problems and to protect yeah. their own national. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. So in a nutshell, or if you boil it down, the Vietnamese strategy is have your defense capabilities and do not back down from these conflicts, but do not gang up against China and do never ever allow yourself to be used again as a, as a, mm-hmm. as a launching pad for any other power, which is That's exactly true. what happened to South and North Vietnam in the, in the Cold War, right? Both of them That's were true. used and abused. And Vietnam is one of North Vietnam is one of the only countries that fought a war with the United States and won, and then fought a war with had to fight a war with China, and still there, right? So, mm-hmm. and the, the leaders who did that, and the, the people are still in power, right? This, this is what fascinated me last year so much. The person who shook Joe Biden's hand while the Americans were like ecstatic about oh having better relationships, <laughs> and you know we're gonna we're gonna sh- stick it to the Chinese. That mm-hmm. guy was fighting the war against the Americans. And then mm-hmm. he he's able to to do this, to do this rational foreign policy, although mm-hmm. he would have every reason to kind of reject any mm-hmm. closer relationship. But Vietnam doesn't do that. Vietnam thinks very mm-hmm. pragmatically, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I well, where, where I read your, your chapter in our neutrality project, uh, I think it's uh, it's very fascinating to me about the, the way that you constructed, um, you know, how historical legacies shape the uh, the ideological consideration and the perceptions of of the Austrian and the Swedes uh, perceptions of neutrality and it's the same for Vietnam as well uh, for Vietnam historical you know legacies play a very important role in their perception of enemies and friends uh, for example the Chinese we uh, we were under a thousand years of domination by the Chinese uh, you know a thousand years ago and we always attacked by Chinese in different dynasties around the world. And the last, the last war that we had actually was with, with the Chinese in uh, 1979. But at the same time, now China, China is the first comprehensive strategic partner of Vietnam. And we have a, you know, cordial party to party relationship between the two communist party. We had China as the biggest trade partner. The important, you know, um, lesson about, you know, Vietnamese Chinese relationship is that, you know, one senior Vietnamese leader uh, said that if you want to be a leader of Vietnam, you must know how to, you know, shake the hand with the Chinese and how to stand up with the Chinese at the same time. You could, because you cannot really you only stand up to the Chinese or you cannot really only, you know, uh, show your hand with the Chinese because then you lost your statehood. So that's the way Vietnam uh, carry out foreign policy. It's not only about pragmatism, but also about the principle. You know, um, you cannot let your sentiments uh, run too deep because otherwise it would be, uh, you know, it would be irrational when you carry out foreign policy. Vietnam and the U.S., for example, it's, it takes. I think it's incredible to see how Vietnam and 
uh, United States have already concealed after, you know, 40 years of the fall of Saigon, the world would kill almost 5 million people. And then within like two or three decades, uh, Vietnam and the United States not becoming a comprehensive trade partner. So basically becoming an economic ally, you know, in a way. Um, and now the United States consider Vietnam with India as the most important swing states in Asia in the 21st century. So I think that's incredible journey of, you know, reconciliation between two countries, not only between Vietnam and the United States, but also between Vietnam and China. So, yeah, I mean, historical legacy, in a sense, I think play a very important role in shaping the perception of how foreign policy can, should be carried, uh, carried out in, in Vietnamese, uh, you know, state. Um, I, I find this all quite fascinating. And one question, and this is purely hypothetical or speculative, but one thing we've seen in the Cold War is that great powers time and again tried to do good diplomacy, useful diplomacy through neutral states. The main example for me is that we had the, the, the Conference for Security and Cooperation in Europe in 1975. Huge agreement, huge success, diplomatic, you know, uh, detente, which was came about because the Soviet Union asked Finland, can you please pitch the idea to the others? Because they knew if we pitch it, then nothing comes up, will come out of it. And the, the, the Finns, they did it. And, you know, it took five years, but it went a positive way. Um, do you think that maybe this is also something on the mind of the Russians to to try to, to uh, ask Vietnam to use its positive ties with the other players in order to, you know, uh, maybe pacify the situation mm -hmm. as well, because what we are seeing is that in, in North Korea, they actually struck a, a hard security deal, but the security deal mm -hmm. says we want stability in mm -hmm. North Asia. The, this is a mm -hmm. goal. No, uh, the, the Korean Peninsula should be stable and peaceful. Mm -hmm. um, while at the same time, if you empower North Korea, this sends a very, very negative uh, mm -hmm. uh, message toward the Japanese and towards South Koreans, right? Do you think that the Russians will, will try to to do or to ask for Vietnam's good offices to help mm -hmm. mend ties? Yeah, I think that's a very important question. And uh, when we start with North Korea, let's uh, remember 2019, when uh, Kim Jong-un actually visited Hanoi uh, by mm. five-day train you know, journey uh, from Pyongyang, you know, passing through China and to Hanoi. And then he met with, uh, you know, President Trump at the time and tried to have, you know, the second Trump and Kim submit and try to, you know, build up some, you know, some, some stabilities between the North Korea, uh, North Korea regime and Washington. It didn't really turn out to be, uh, very successful, uh, conferences, but I think that said, uh, one of the very important, um, goals of the Vietnamese states uh, as becoming a more active neutral state, you know, in a way that you are not picking sides, but you are trying to promoting, um, you know, international law, uh, rules and orders and try to reconcile different uh, perceptions, different, you know, the differences between uh, different sides. And uh, it's even very important because um, in 2022, when Prime Minister of Vietnam, Phan Minh Chính, visited uh, Washington and, and deliver uh, a speech at the CSIS uh, when being asked which size of the war between, you know, uh, Ukraine and, and Russia, which size that Vietnam chose. Uh, the Prime Minister said that we, we didn't chose, we didn't really choose size, but we chose uh, justice. We try to reconcile, we try to, to make peace, uh, you know, uh, instead of war. And I think that's, that's the way that the Vietnamese, I think, is playing a very important role because um, the case of Russia, you know, is 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 new. You know, Putin just visited Hanoi a few days ago, so we we're not really sure whether Putin really conveyed his uh, message, uh, you know, from Vietnam to Washington. But Vietnam has played a very positive, I think, uh, communicator between China and the United States during the Great Power rivalry because you know Vietnam as a communist state uh, and being very friendly to the United States i think play an extremely important role in you know becoming a kind of like backdoor uh, communication channel to you know between china and us so i think becoming an active neutral state like vietnam it can definitely play a bigger role in reconciling uh, russian enterprise uh, i think for that unfortunately i think it's quite unfortunate for for vietnam when it 
Liechtenstein any dele- delegates to the Ukraine peace summit uh, recently. I think it would be a misstep uh, from the Vietnamese foreign policy, but I, I think, but but that that can change in the future, uh, because for Vietnam to become a more active neutral state, it should uh play a more active role in promoting, uh you know reconciliation between different sides, not only between you know the Russian and the West, uh, in bringing a more uh more pragmatic and uh, you know sustainable solutions to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but also to reconcile um, the differences between China and US. And if Vietnam can do so, of course, it can be a very, very important, very, um, very successful, um, you know, actively neutral state as uh, it wants to, at the same time, it can, you know, protect its own national interests as well, as, as well as, you know, promoting its national image as a very, um, you know, very um, international um, country. You know, they go together. Neutral states, the, the biggest misunderstanding is that neutral states stay out of everything and don't do anything. It, the, the opposite is the case. They always have to do multi, uh, multi-aligned multi diplomacy and they have to do trade because the diplomacy is the other side of trade. So you do that and you have the capacity to engage with, with others. And in, in this sense, I do think Vietnam is currently playing an absolutely wonderful game. Uh, I, I, I really, really admire the capacity of the of, of, of the Vietnamese diplomats uh, and, and the policy thinkers at the moment. Um, we, we, we are reaching our time. So, uh, uh, Dr. Wen, where can people find your analysis and your writing? What's the best place to follow you? Well, I, I, um, I wrote a column on fundgroom. Dot .hg, which is my, um, you know, my, my institute's um, publication outlet. I also write um, uh, occasionally for other uh, publications like the Diplomat and the East Asia Forum. And so, of course, I, I co-wrote, uh, I wrote a chapter in the book, which is going to be published very soon with you as well. So I think uh, people would learn a lot from your chapter as much as I do. Thank you very much. I will link all of this in the description uh, and then uh, we'll follow up with you uh, pretty soon, I hope. Dr. Wen, thank you very much for today. My pleasure. It's been great talking to you.